Paul, welcome back to the show. What Thank have you, you been up to this week? I have been playing Terra Nil. It's a demo. It's uh, like an isometric city builder, except you have to like unbuild your city by the end of the round. It's it's kind of neat. It's free well, on you Steam. Have to... Anybody can pick it Whoa. up. You have to unbuild your city. Yeah, it's it's like a it's kind of a puzzle. I guess all city builders are kind of a puzzle, but. Uh, it, the land starts off desolate and you have to place down all these buildings to like clean up the pollution and like seed a bunch of different biomes and then the <gasps> final phase is you pack yeah. everything up and leave and it's like it converts the wasteland to the beautiful lush vegetation land i saw the preview for this maybe in an e3 in a previous year and i fell in love with just the whole just the idea of starting with this complete you know, brown desolation and t slowly turning the land green. Like, I just yeah. love any game that lets you do that. So that's cool. Yeah, I played the demo. The demo has proc gen levels in it. Like, every level is, is generated randomly. Um, and you can only ever play the first level in the demo, but you can play a different first level every time. So I played it a bunch, then my kids all played it, and we had a good time. Nice. How about you? What have you been playing? Here's something that I find very interesting. A lot of media loves to use Judeo-Christian stuff as mythology, right? Um, how You just think of how many stories have angels versus demons, and there's a very Christian idea of, not just Christian, but a very stereotypical um, idea of heaven and hell. Mm, yeah, Darksiders like, had the Nephilim and all that stuff. Right. And it's not just Christian. Like, there's Paradise Lost that took the stuff in the <laughs> right. Bible. The, the stuff in the Bible is actually incredibly tiny and very vague, and you can't make much out of it. And Paradise Lost, like, turned that into a mythology that you could actually picture what's going on. And then mm. all of these later writers came and took Paradise Lost and used it as setting details. And there's nothing inherently wrong with that, but you do get tired of it after a while. Like Diablo, everything from Diablo to Doom to every movie that has you fighting demons. Yeah. Um, and it bothers you me in two ways. Uh, one, it bothers me just because it's like, oh, here's eight, here's demons. They've got to, they got to fight. I've just seen this so many times before. And the other thing that bothers me is that you can't help, because I'm familiar with the source material, I can't help but sit there and think like, hey, that's not how that works. <laughs> right, right. It's like all the fantasy games or novels or whatever that crib off of Tolkien. It's like, hey, that's not really what orcs do. Or that's not really what elves are about. Right. No, I understand from a storytelling perspective why you wouldn't want to be biblical but like you're on mars base and the demons start pouring through the porthole and the doom marine comes in all right boys it's time for a prayer meeting and he sits everybody down and they all just start pregnant like that would not be a good story that would not be a good video game <laughs> well it wouldn't be a good shooter anyway right it would be it would be the worst shooter ever You'd st you'd be practicing shooting, and then you'd hear about the demons coming. You'd be like, "Well, these guns are going to be useless against this supernatural <laughs> threat, so uh -oh. let's just get rid of them and and we'll go pray." That would be a really terrible shooter, and nobody would want to play it. So I understand why they do that, but then you know when you're familiar with the source material, you're like, "But that's not how." That's not what they would do, and that's not what we would do, and that's not how any of this works. And yeah. you just you just got to roll with it, of course. I mean, it's you know, the, 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 but it that makes it so delightful when I run into a work that is completely unaffected by Western traditions, like has not been anywhere near any has has nothing to do mm. with the Bible or Paradise Lost because it's totally unfamiliar and I don't have any preconceived notions of how it should work. Right. And that's Ghostwire Tokyo. Oh. 
it is this game is super weird i i shouldn't call it weird like i'm not trying to offend japanese but boy your religion sure is weird like i don't even know if this is accurate to anything that any japanese person actually believes right <laughs> It's the equivalent of all the biblical demons and angels and stuff in games. Exactly. Like somebody that's really into Japanese Shinto. religion would look at the, Shinto, that's it, would look at this and go, oh, that's not how any of this works. So, but to a, to a foreigner like me, it is absolutely wild and so delightful. Um, you start the game off is like, there's, some sort of evil guy. Is he a demon? Is he just a supernatural being? Is he a regular person that has used some sort of magic to gain powers he shouldn't have? I don't know the source material, so I have no way of knowing what this guy is. Mm, yeah. Like, a Japanese person might look at this guy's costume and go, ah, that's a demon. But I don't know. I don't know what he is. I just know that he um, sort of steals, but like this fog rolls through the street, and when it envelops people, they vanish. So like their clothes and all their belongings just collapse to the ground, and their bodies vanish. Hmm. And there's, and while this is going on, you know, in downtown Tokyo, your character is lying on the ground. You've just been in a car crash. Unrelated, just this happens to have occurred right <laughs> the, when a car the fog crashed. didn't like make your brakes vanish or something. Right, right. <laughs> so your character is just like face down on the pavement, either dying or dead, and that gives you an immunity to to whatever this is. And another character sort of enters your body and helps you defend yourself. And he's a Apparently the spirit of some sort of paranormal investigator. <laughs> what? And he teaches you, like, supernatural kung fu that you can use to, like, now that now the fog is rolled through, all the people are gone, and there are these weird faceless monsters roaming the streets. And it's kind of action game, but also almost survival horror. Hmm. And um, you have to go around town and... And like free these spirits and you're trying to get like this part of Tokyo is been sealed off by the bad guy and he's we don't know what his plan is yet but he's like harvesting all these souls and you have to get the souls out of his quarantined area and here I'm just gonna describe it you get these little paper dolls you go around and you hold up the paper doll and the floating spirits of these people go into the paper doll and then you go to a phone booth and you dial a number and you stick the paper doll into the phone and their spirit is transmitted outside of this quarantine zone so that they escape escape his his plans and they can go into their bodies later hmm. is that the ghost wire part you, pff, i didn't even think of that i guess so <laughs> like that hardline is, ghost wire tokyo right so that is a lot of very strange ideas to a Westerner. Yeah, and I yeah. was just absolutely delighted with every one of them because I couldn't, because it was actually mysterious to me as opposed to, yeah, 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 oh, th y there's some demons, and let me guess, we need a friggin' sword. There's only this one sword <laughs> that can kill the demons that I have to get. Like, it was none of that. It was nothing I could have guessed. And it made me wow. so happy. And also, the game is ridiculously gorgeous and just sort of haunting. It's it's raining and nighttime in Tokyo, and it is gorgeous. Very cool. So I love this game. I am super delighted with it. Highly recommended. Although I've only played like two hours of it. Well, speaking of weird games that are kind of cool looking, but that maybe you wouldn't have guessed would exist, uh, I think we've both played Hyperbolica in the past couple of weeks. Yes, we have. I've been looking forward to this one for ages. My uh, my wife came up to watch us play a little bit. Uh, I was playing with the kids, and and they're like, "Oh, can we play? Can we play?" And and so she walks up and she's like, "I can't watch this. It's making me sick." <laughs> like, okay, that's right. fine. So, I I forget how it works, but I think it is a 
world where you have to make four left turns to wind up back where you were instead of three. Like to go around the block, you make four 90 degree angle turns, bring you back to your original spot, right? Is that yeah, it? Yeah, well, in the in the overworld, it's it's six, I think. There are six squares. There are six squares on every corner, right? Instead of four squares on a corner. Um, but I I think in in different areas, the, the hyperbolicity changes as well. Oh. Uh, so I like I, I, maybe some of them it's five, but I don't know. That explains why. I, well, at one point you do a maze, and like a maze is just <laughs> like uh, you're like, come on, a maze. This is gonna be so easy. All right, I just need to like keep in mind that it's fine. I'll just I'll just picture it. You know, it's it's like it's like it's made out of circles <laughs> yeah. instead of squares, and I, that no problem. I can track that, and it was like. 12 seconds later, I was baffled. Just the the assumption of moving around on a 2D <laughs> map is so baked into your brain. I could not... All right, I'm going to turn left, and then I'll be facing north. No, I won't be facing north. And in fact, if I make four turns, I'll be facing north again, but it won't be the same north. And like, ah! <laughs> oh, I can't do it. Your poor monkey brain. I know, it was terrible, it was like embarrassing. It's like, I know that I can't treat this like a 2D map, and yet that's the only thing my brain would do. So I kept, I just had to brute force it. You didn't bring up the map? I mean, they give you a map. Oh yeah, yeah, I, I brought up the map, but even that, like the, the map helps you with direction, like I need to go that-ish way, but navigating there is still a handful. Yeah, man. Yeah, just a, a brain twister. Incredible. And it, like you said, it's not a complicated thing. It's like this is a maze, and all of the corners are right angles, right? Like this isn't anything complicated. There are no bridges. There's no tunnels. And there's no teleporters. It's just plain old. You know, everything's right? on a level. Nothing overlaps. You know, there are a few loops, but it's not. You know, it's not complicated. But it's like the only catch is that it's in hyperdimensional space and so like you know her hyperbolic space so, so you turn four times around and and you're somewhere else instead of being back where you started oh it's so yeah you just get embarrassed by my inability to like map to that space but i loved it i absolutely it just made me happy hmm mm. yeah it was very cool I think we should have all of our games in hyperbolic space now. I mean, because you get so much yes. more, you can travel so quickly from one place to another, but there's also so much more space that you can travel through. It was just, it was really cool that, that you could fit all these things. Like, it's this very small area, and you can travel in like 10 seconds from the center of the area to any other place. But if you try to travel around the perimeter of the area, it takes you like 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah. And again, that also sort of just, messes with your expectations about how like we, we use stuff like that to figure out how big a place is when you get to the snow area i had exactly that problem i knew i needed to find a, a certain i needed to find the catapult and i'm like oh i i know it was around here on the outer wall well i'll just walk along the outer wall to find it <laughs> and after a bunch of walking i'm like holy cow this is taking forever Right, because even though you're always close to the center, there's a lot more edge than you're used to having. <laughs> right, right. The, the circumference of the circle is like way bigger than pi times the diameter. Right, yeah, exactly. Uh, and one thing I found really difficult was um, in that same snowy area, you have the snowball fight. And planning the trajectories of snowballs with your with the kids you're throwing snowballs at is actually annoying like it's again yeah, how that, much do you lead you, you know that they're moving yeah. and you're like oh i'll just lead by this much but it's like nope it's hyperbolic space you're leading by way more than you think yeah exactly and i was constantly overshooting like i see him moving to the side so i try and lead him and i'm way too far <laughs> yeah oh man what a game it is something I haven't uh, I've only cleared two areas the the base game itself is like super primitive it's like go to the five areas and collect the five crystals yeah and um, but that's fine like I don't even I wouldn't even have any suggestions like what would you do better 
I don't I I don't need this to be a big, you know, story and cutscenes and conversations. It's just like we're here for hyperbolic space, and that's what it gives us. Yeah, although there is quite a bit of dialogue if you go looking for it. Have you made it to the farm right. yet? No, I have not. I was looking for the farm because um, that's the one I really wanted to see the most. I've seen, I, I saw the farm on YouTube like six months ago when the, the designer was talking about, oh, here's something you can do with hyperbolic space is I can stick the world on the inside of a sphere. <laughs> it was just this insane thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's it's a different kind of space. That's spherical space. So it's like the opposite of, of Cartesian that we're used to, where everything wraps around instead of everything splicing out and getting further apart. Yeah. Yeah, the spherical world was, was pretty crazy, too. Oh, well, good. So what else have you been playing? All right, well, I remember um, back in 2019, I remember saying, holy cow, March of 2020 is going to be absolutely bonkers. Look at all these games that are going to come out in March of 2020. And it was like, mm -hmm. it was like the Vampire game and Kerbal Space Program 2. And I forget what they all were. A whole bunch of stuff was, oh, Cyberpunk was one of them. All of these are going to land in March of, of 2020. That's going to be amazing. And then the pandemic hit. And, like, everybody just threw the schedule away and a bunch of games just vanished into nothing. Like, two years later, they're still not out and they still don't have release dates. But then mm -hmm. this March, we finally got that kind of crazy month. This month, we got Tiny Teen Tina's Wonderlands, Ghostwire Tokyo, and the really big game this year is Elden Ring. And we also got Hyperbolica. Like, that's a, that's a lot for one month. Yeah, yeah, there's some really big titles. All in the same month. Um, yeah, on YouTube, all anybody's talking about is Elden Ring. But, like, it's, it, it feels good to see all this stuff coming out. It, it feels like we're not um, still trapped in this limbo of the pandemic. Mm, yeah. Stuff is coming out again. So that that's encouraging. Have you played Elden Ring? No, no. No, but I mean, I've watched tons of videos on it because it, it's a fascinating topic. I just don't want to play a game that'll make me angry. <laughs> there's right. a there's right. a channel I follow, Iron something, Iron Pineapple, I think, talks about it. And you know, this is somebody who's played Dark Souls and and Demon Souls and all all those games, all those super hard games, right? for years mm -hmm. and even played all the weird obscure indie ones and he was doing some challenge run with with Elden Ring and he talks about oh man this boss it beat me 10 times or I I had to fight him for an hour to beat him and I'm like oh my gosh this expert level player took that <laughs> long to beat this boss like I would have had it I would have lost my mind <laughs> not for you well, there is a game that you've played, uh, The Witcher, and I got a free copy. In fact, I think everybody who has a GOG account got a free copy of Witcher the Enhanced Edition. The original? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, we're not talking about Witcher 3. No. No, they, they sent out an email saying, hey, here's a free code for The Witcher. I was like, all right, sure. Um, so I'm on my Linux computer, and I'm like, okay, well, how do I install GOG on Linux? And they're like, eh, it's not really a thing. Oh, <laughs> so, and then it was like, do I really want to play The Witcher, like the original one, the one with all the sexy time cards? And it's like, yeah, I don't know. I've got better things to do with my life. Yeah, uh, people, people hated on me for not liking the first Witcher game. Well, I, I was thinking about this when I when I was looking at Elden Ring this month. I was like, maybe I should cop, maybe I should cover Elden Ring somehow just to cover it, because it is the center of the conversation. And I realized that would be the worst thing in the world. It's a game everybody's praising. The best thing that could possibly happen is that I would also like it, and then just say what everybody else has already been saying, which means my content <laughs> has no reason to exist. And the worst thing that could happen is if I've got a problem with it, and I'm going to dare to criticize this thing that literally everybody else loves. And there will just be no forgiveness. Like, nobody cares why you don't like it. How dare you? 
this is the perfect game. So there is no there's no win for you there to like once a game becomes too popular there's no reason to cover it <laughs> and coverage is kind of the point is to let people know hey this thing exists but everyone already knows that it exists right um and i kind of had the same thing with the original witcher like everybody loved it i did not care for it at all and people did not forgive me for that how dare you not love it well we won't talk about it then um, I was watching a, a little trailer on YouTube about Ixion, I-X-I-O-N. And it's this, like, space city builder kind of game. It's got the story, like a bunch of story stuff and cutscenes. Um, but it reminded me very much of a much older game called Startopia. I don't know if you played Startopia. I've never even heard of it. It was... I don't even know when it was made, but is uh, back in the day and it's this the idea is that there's these aliens and they have stumbled upon this big circular space station spinning around for gravity and it's all cordoned off in sections and uh, they're renting out sections to you. It's kind of a goofy comedy vibe. Uh, you know, different aliens have different preferences and different feel and but it's it's very lighthearted. It's a very lighthearted thing. So it's like, you know, you've got this giant old space station. So is it like, um, what was the Maxis game about building a skyscraper? Like Sim Tower. That, but Sim Tower, yeah. Is it like Sim Tower in space? Yeah, it's it's kind of like Sim Tower, where there's like, except there's an existing space station, but it doesn't have like any of the facilities you need. It's just like this big empty warehouse in space, basically. And so you go up there and you're building different buildings and they serve the different needs of the different aliens and you're trying to balance things. And then as you get more and more successful and bring more aliens to the station, they unlock more sections for you. And then they're like other aliens will rent other sections and you can have like you can fight them inside the space station. So it's kind of like this goofy, you know, space city thing. Um, and so then I was looking at Ixion and Ixion's like this very serious, like environmental and I'm not saying that like the environmental problems of the earth should not be taken seriously i'm just saying that this game did take it seriously but then it set all of its gameplay inside of this space station that people on earth had built but that is just this big empty box that like doesn't have any facilities in it <laughs> it's, it's like, a common wait, thing of people just building enormous structures in space for no reason <laughs> right like did you guys not have a plan for where people would live when they came here and like do you have no idea what you want people to do here? Why did you build it if you didn't have any plan in place? So it was just, it was very silly. Like, it's very silly to take this silly premise and all the gameplay from it and then just like port it entire to this very serious setting. And I, it, the uh, the whiplash was, was too much for me. So I, I don't think I'm going to be looking into that. Although I'll probably watch the cutscenes on YouTube because they're very pretty. That's hilarious. Speaking of watching things on YouTube... Oh, yeah. So I saw a brilliant YouTube video, and I realized this is the lamest thing in the world. Like, hey, here's a great YouTube video, and I want to share it with you on my podcast. <laughs> but this video was so profound, talking about, here's the title, the next real-time strategy game will fail. Here's why. And this is absolutely brilliant. This entire um, video explains why the real-time strategy um, genre seems to be dead and why we're still playing the, what, 12-year-old StarCraft II? Mm -hmm. Why are we still playing that and no new game has come along to challenge it? And the games that have come along have been remakes of earlier games. And the main thing is... Um, when somebody wants to challenge StarCraft, they look at the success of StarCraft. Wow, look at how important StarCraft is. It's so big, it, it supports its own esports, you know, league. Mm. So if we want to be big, we need to make sure we support esports. Let's build this hardcore ladder match between expert level players. And um, that's backwards, according to the person that made this video. Yeah, and, how are you going to get expert level players if no one plays your game? And the case that he makes is, yes, those players are indeed very intense, 
but they are a tiny, tiny, tiny slice of your audience. Mm -hmm. And the real, the real secret, like, it's a natural mistake to make. All right, we, we want community feedback. Let's take some pillars of the community. Whoever is really big, um, you know, in, in our fandom, and we'll talk to those people. But you're talking to those people, and those are the hardest of the hardcore. And they're going to tell you what they're interested in. But that's not what most players are interested. 80% of the players are filthy casuals that don't want to jump on the ladder and fight humans. They want right. to... They don't want balanced sides. They want to have ridiculously big armies and crazy units and and wild scenarios, and they want to play against the AI in in some sort of campaign. And this is very true of me. I, you know, I've yeah, me too. I've yeah. And the other thing he said you need is uh, really good tools for community made content, and that everybody forgets this that how much of the community is fueled by user-made content. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Warcraft and 3 the, is still, like, is, it's, well, we talked about this before on the show. It spawned several genres of games. Right. Warcraft 3 spawned MOBAs and tower defense. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and that auto is... auto battlers, kind of. Right. So that's like crazy. That's just this incredibly fertile ground from which so many other things grew. Um, and everybody's like, oh, we want to copy it. Well, we've got to make sure we have ladder matches, which is very much putting the cart before, way before the horse. Right. And then, and why would you need modding tools if all you're doing is ladder matches? Exactly. Exactly. So they, they build a community for this hardcore ladder crowd. But, like, the audience is small, so those people never show up. Right. Yeah, oh, so... Wow. Yeah, I, I skimmed through the video. I didn't watch the whole thing, but it he seemed to have some really good insights. But it made me wish that somebody was, you know, still making RTS games. The, the genre is dead, you know, in the sense that it's been ages since anybody... The, the last one was a few years ago. They put out a Homeworld sequel where it was on the ground instead of in space and it was well received but of course just you know it didn't go any you know it it came and went and starcraft 2 remains the rts and all these other ga games come and the the community plays with them for a month and then they vanish again yeah it and, reminds me of planetary annihilation which is like a total annihilation spiritual successor i guess or whatever and uh all through development the developers are like we're really into the the hardcore bro like team match fighting each other cooperative competitive team-based and it's like i don't care about that i don't know if anyone else does but like stop telling me about your ladder matches i just want to have cool robots and space blowing planets up like why can't we have right. that and they and like during development they're like we're not gonna have titans because titans aren't viable in the competitive multiplayer scene or whatever and uh, i was like okay fine like i you know if you don't if you don't think that your customers want that but then like two years later they're like oh we're gonna release a completely separate game uh, planetary relation <laughs> titans that's got titans in it and it's like okay yeah you guys but they still don't get the idea that like this should be this should be a toy to play with it's not like some sort of hardcore you know like football padded guys doing drills out on the field like this is this is supposed to be fun yeah it it is supposed to be fun and I, it's interesting how do you get the hardcore people to show up eventually but you're going to make your most of your money at first from those filthy filthy casuals yeah who just want to who just want to steamroll the ai with titans <laughs> i just right. want a right. great i want to build something really really big that takes up like half the screen that blows up the bad guy base yeah and and you know i played more than a little bit of planetary annihilation titans just cuz it's fun right <sighs> Well, here's hoping that, the, because that was like one of the pillars of gaming back in the 90s was RTS games. And and now, now it barely exists. The mm. one game that that's still going strong is 12 years old. And a At Blizzard game, right? 
You can't beat those guys. Yeah. At least yeah. back in the day. I actually, after watching all this stuff on StarCraft II, I watched that video and then, of course, this this guy, I can't remember his name and I don't have it in a window here, but I will link it in the show notes. Um, it's a... Uh, he has a lot of, he is one of the few creators that focuses on single player content. Instead of ladder matching, he's always like, I'm going to play the campaign under some ridiculous constraints. Like, I'm going to only <laughs> build marines, or I'm not going to lose a single unit, or I'm not going to kill a single enemy unit. Just these ridiculous self-imposed challenges on the campaign. And his ch channel is incredibly popular. And after watching him play StarCraft for like an hour yesterday, I was like, you know what I could go for? And I just installed the Blizzard <laughs> launcher. It, when we're done with the podcast, StarCraft 2 will be done installing for me. Oh, man. I've got, I've got Hyperbolica and Ghostwire Tokyo. I have no business installing a 12-year-old game right now, but I was like, oh, maybe just, just a little. Just, just... Just one drink, and then I'm going to go straight home. <laughs> oh, boy. Well, speaking of getting trapped, I was uh, updating my auto payment. My credit card expired, and the bank sent me a new one, and so I had to go on. You know how some some companies or whatever have, like, the expiration date, and some don't ask for the expiration date, and it seems to be fine for them? Right. And some of them are like, oh, your credit card's expiring. You need to send us a new one. And all I'm doing is just, like, updating the year right to the next right, same you know, number. four years from now yeah exactly so there was an interesting range of so this is like the multi-factor authentication redux thing because there's an interesting range of of things like the city where i live i've got my my utilities there and uh their account you've got the login to their website and then but they don't like they when they send you the the um the monthly statements it's not like you can't log into your account from the monthly statements. You have to like go to the city's website and then log in from there. So it, it, that's a kind of weird roundabout thing. But then once you get there, you can just like, you know, go over to your credit card and say like edit and change the year. And it's like, cool, it's done. And then uh, what was it? The, the power guys, they had like, you have to enter a new payment method. And so like you add a new payment method and then like type in your credit card number again and then delete the right. old payment method, right? And it's like, why do I have to do this? But okay, fine. Um, but the craziest one was my internet. And they made me, uh, what was it? I had to log into the website. And to log into the website, I had to get two-factor authentication from my email. And then uh, I was able to log in. And I was able to view my payment settings, my auto pay settings. But in order to change the auto payment settings, I have to download the app for my phone and then get two-factor oh. authentication to my phone in order to log in on the app and then once i'm logged in on the app then i can change my payment account information um but i can't like oh, copy I and paste that. my my credit card number because i'm on my phone and it's a real pain so so i had to like type it in one digit at a time on my phone i was like you guys you guys why why is this so dumb like my stupid podunk town knows how to let me change the expiration date on my credit card. Why do you guys have such trouble? I'm trying to give you money. This isn't like someone's going to steal my account information and start paying for my internet. Right? <laughs> Please. I'll publish my, my credentials if you make that possible. Maybe somebody will do it. <laughs> right, exactly. It's like, oh, why is this is so roundabout and nonsense? So, oh, man. And speaking of annoying technology, this is my last topic. Uh, I have been updating my the my website has got this very old gallery software, and the developers like given up on the project. It's all abandoned where, and it's all written in PHP, and it was written in like PHP four or something, and it's oh, wow. slowly so getting out of date. Yeah, yeah, it's it's. I I think I installed it back in like two thousand eight or something. I was just going to say, I remember PHP 5 was, I have a joke in um, DM of the Rings when they're trying to cross the mountain and they're having a conversation about installing PHP 5. And that's how I remember <laughs> when PHP 5 comes out, came out. Yeah. So they've there were some updates. I think it's like at PHP 5 or 6 or something. Um, 
but like a few years ago it stopped working and i was like why did it stop working and so we looked into it and my webmaster and i is like oh it's because the error log is full of depreciation error warnings and uh i was like oh well <laughs> that's easy just turn off depreciation error warnings good job done and went back to my life so then about a month ago we updated to PHP 8, and it turns out that those depreciating error warnings, uh, they weren't kidding around, because now it just doesn't work at all. That's hilarious. So so I've been going back through, so I, I rolled it back to PHP 7.4 or whatever, and uh, and I turned on depreciation error warnings, and there's like, so you refresh the page, right, to get it to generate all the errors, and there's like four megabytes of errors or whatever. And so I go through there, and a few of them are like, you know, you can't uh, you can't use curly brackets to access member variables. You have to use square brackets now, and like that seems like the kind of thing that you could just fix for me. Maybe PHP, you think? Right. But no, no, it makes me fix that myself. So fine. And then a, a like a huge majority of them were, and so this is like the the open uh, not open the object oriented programming thing of like object oriented programming. The idea is to make it easier for programmers to do their job, right? I mean, that's the idea. That's the idea. That's the sales pitch, right? It's going to be easier for you, the programmer. So here I am, and I've got four megabytes of error warning saying, hey, you can't call a static method as a, you know, like a, a member method as a static method. And like, what are you doing? What are you even thinking? And I'm like, I don't know. I, I don't care if it's static or not. Can I make them all public? Can I make them all if it's, dynamic? If, it, if it's impossible, then why did it work before, smartass? <laughs> right. Like, I know. It I know. It definitely worked. It, it still works, right? Like, it's just all these error words like, hey, in, in PHP 8, this is going to be illegal. It's like, why is it going to be illegal? Are you trying to make my life easier? Clearly not. So I go through and I, I'm like, okay, well, I, you know, like, which ones do I have to change? And of course, it's like, every function in every class and everything in PHP is in a class because you have to have it in a class because it has to be object oriented. And so I'm going through like all these different classes and like there's all these functions and they're all called from other functions. So I have to make them public and I have to make them static. And so I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to replace all the functions with static functions. That'll be fine. And so then, and then I get a whole bunch of errors saying like, Fatal PHP error. You can't call the this pointer from inside a static function. What are you thinking? And I'm like, what are you thinking? Making me change all these things and now I can't call access my members. So it's like, oh, why? So now I'm going back through and like unchanging all the stuff that has a this pointer in it. So it's not static anymore so that it can access the member variables. And like, this is the madness that you end up in in, in object oriented. Like, I don't mind being able to do object oriented program. But I don't want to be forced to do it, especially not forced to do it in a way that that someone thinks is the best way, right? Like, let me do it how I want. Right. If you want a good critique of object-oriented program, you know, the, the debate has raged for years. And uh, for a while, Brian Will was the um, go-to guy for criticizing object-oriented programming. But for me, uh, the new gold standard is Mike Acton. He is a developer at um, oh, what what's the the zombie game where you could like skate on power lines? Can't remember. Oh wow, I don't know. Sunset Overdrive. Oh, I can't believe I blanked out on that. Sunset Overdrive. You, you could, that's the zombie fighting game, but it's a comedy zombie fighting game like you can bounce on a car hood as if it was a trampoline and get up on the power lines and skate around on them it's absolutely <laughs> ridiculous anyway uh he was their lead technology guy and he has he, he has a great video on youtube that i will link in the show notes where he talks about data oriented design and he sort of points out the oh you, you know the 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 goals of object oriented programming are it's all about the code it's all about making beautiful code it's all about making code that works like the real world and he's like none of that is your goal your goal as a programmer <laughs> is to transform data the data is what matters not the code you don't care how yeah. you solve it you 
you care if you transform the data properly. And um, and he talks about all the ways that our object-oriented programming fails to do that. And um, it's it is stuff that I've sort of intuitively worked out on my own but never put into words and I never would have had the confidence to like state them because I always figure well I mean if I was right about this then why hasn't somebody said it already <laughs> right well and what do I know right I'm just one programmer and I've only worked right. in one specific area and so maybe in the whole industry is different somehow right um, and especially as a games developer we have some we have some very particular needs with regards to performance we are really sensitive to performance problems mm, um right in a way that a lot of other domains just aren't anyway data oriented design by mike acton fascinating video highly recommended i will link it in the show notes okay dear diecast there was a lot of discussion on the blog over the past week and this was a few weeks ago about protagonist versus main character and who is what, etc. Isn't there an inherent problem with video games compared to other media in that the author often doesn't want the main character to have agency? Although it doesn't have to be this way, etc. etc. Uh, what do you think the best games you can think of are that don't go this route and actually allow the player character to have agency in a game by not having an NPC order them around and still, still tell a good story by the end? Uh, my suggestion would be Planescape Torment and uh, No Signature. So thanks, No Signature guy. My suggestion is just to have the exact same thing, but just change the dialogue. Have my character, instead of saying, all right, I need to defeat the bad guy, we need the sword of defeating guys. Go to the top of the mountain and get the sword for me, player. Okay. No, instead you have the player say, I'm going to find out how to beat the bad guy. And then when he hears, oh, we need that sword, I'm going to go get that sword. And the, the protagonist decides to do that. So the protagonist is the one driving the story. There, they have... Now, that, that puts it in the protagonist's control and not necessarily the player's. But that's just... Th that's the most basic and obvious way to remedy the problem of games treating the player character like a child and just ordering them around everywhere. Um, right. And just if, allow the, the player's character to be the one who makes the decision or ostensibly makes the decision. I mean, still, it's the author of the game who's making the decision, right? Is like putting words in the player right. character's mouth. But at least it's in the player character's mouth and then not some third party character. Right. Like if you were watching a movie, it is absolutely you would expect the main character to go, I'm going to go do this thing instead of them sitting there doing nothing while some third some tertiary character is like i've made decisions for you on how you need to be spending your time protagonist like they would <laughs> obviously that would get red penned in any hollywood script but then video game designers come along and they do not recognize that as a massive flaw and if you've got a situation where hey it doesn't make sense that my character would decide to do a and then also design to do b it's like Good! Now you're writing a character with motivations and you have to reconcile that. Yeah. You, you, the actions that the character decides to take will tell you what sort of person they are. You don't need to tell me he's an ex-Navy SEAL with a torture past and a woman he can't forget. We will learn about who he is by seeing the decisions that he makes within the story. That's the real personality, not the fake personality you tell us he has at the beginning of the game, but the personality he demonstrates himself to have through his actions as the story unfolds. And you can tell me yeah. he's... Yeah. Like, you can tell me, oh, he's tortured and he doesn't play by the rules. Oh, really? What does he do during the game? Oh, everything people tell him to do. <laughs> <laughs> he's this doormat of a character, but you know he's supposedly this this rogue. If you if you have the character, if you have the protagonist make decisions, and then you use that to shape their personality, then you'll know what kind of backstory to give them. Mm. So there you go. 
we haven't addressed player agency because that's a whole other ball of wax, but protagonist agency, it's just a matter of not being a bad writer. Okay. Dear Diecast, I hope you're doing well. I remember Seamus talking about how he's working on a piece about my, Microsoft's Activision of... Let me bring this over to my main monitor. I can't read things on my giant secondary monitor. That's just awkward. I recently saw this video that he could use as part of his research. It brings up some good points. I see a lot of people overlooking. This is about Microsoft buying Activision Blizzard. And then there's a link to a YouTube video. Fair warning, it's by game theory. All right, so here's the thing. We're going to stop right here. Keep being awesome, Lino. Yeah, Le thank you for the email, Lino. I tried to watch this. Now, I have to be very careful here because game theory is an order of magnitude more popular than my YouTube channel. And so you don't want to throw shade at your betters. That's just going out. That's going out on the the playground, finding the a kid twice your size and kicking dirt on his shoes. You're just asking for <laughs> trouble you can't handle. Right, right. Um, but yes, I also find game theory to be aggressively annoying. And I could not make it very far in that video. I had to shut it off. I uh have lots of small kids at home, so I'm inured to annoying people, and I made it all the way through the video. <laughs> <laughs> it was all right. I, I thought his suggestion, so it, it basically boils down to, like, no, Disney isn't going to buy Nintendo because Nintendo doesn't want to be bought, and, you know, Disney doesn't want to develop video games. And so he goes through a number of different permutations and, and makes some suggestions on what uh, what he thinks the the acquisitions might be, like Comcast buying uh, Capcom or something like that. But um, it's it, you know it's kind of speculation on on why large companies would want to buy video games and uh, or video game companies. And uh, yeah, I, I thought it was it wasn't bad. Uh, I mean, I don't know if he's correct or not, but you know. So it was an interesting. It was an interesting video. Okay. There wasn't any question in the in the email though, so we can't really answer it. Right. I don't know. That that's just my answer is I can't watch game theory videos. I understand they're popular, <laughs> and I'm going to allow that there are reasons for that popularity, but they are lost on me. It's like an epilepsy warning only for game theory. Right. Go ahead and take this next one. Dear Diecast. High-profile tactics games like XCOM and Civilization have found that if you tell players that they are 80% probable to win something, then they will feel like they should basically always win all the time and complain if the numbers are off. That the numbers are off if they lose one out of five times. To solve this issue, games lie. So if your actual chance is 80%, the game reports it at 70%, and this feels right to most people. Similarly, if you lost several times in a row, the game will cheat to give you a bonus to break your losing streak because. Even though it's perfectly normal for runs of bad luck, players complain that the dice are loaded against them if this actually happens while they're playing. How do you feel about this practice? Is there a better way to convey this information? And if players are persistently bad at probability, should designers give them fake numbers that line up with their intuitions? 93% to hit 93. Thank you, 93. That is, uh, My... yeah, that's always annoyed me that that games cheat on their probabilities. Um, yeah, I, I don't think they should cheat. I mean, that's my, that's along the short of my view. I... I agree, and if I was, if somebody was asking me, okay, what, what should we do about this? Because players will be dissatisfied if we don't cheat, but if we do cheat, then other players will be, will just lose all faith in the game, and like, why should I even play this? Like, none of these numbers mean anything. You're lying to me. Um, my suggestion would be, the, the problem I see it is that the player has to consider each dice roll in isolation they have a sample size of one and that's too small so if you can do a whole bunch of dice rolls at once if they've got an automatic weapon don't roll the dice once and say yeah your entire spray of gunfire missed yeah roll it 10 yeah, times right yeah ro roll it 10 times and like oh look at that eight of your 10 bullets hit um and that solves a multitude of problems. Just that, yeah, that'll feel right to the point. Now, <laughs> you still have the problem if something really unlikely happens. Like, you've got a 90% chance to hit. And then you take a swing, and by some miracle, 
you miss 10 times in a row, yeah, players are going to get really, really sore about that. But statistically, that's going to be fantastically rare. <laughs> right, so right. The, the problem will solve itself. Um, I think, too, um, there, the, the solution behind the scenes could just be brought out in front and, and presented to the player. Like, you know, if you're losing a bunch in a row, it, it automatically gives you a hit, right? And like, you could just have like, every time you lose, you get a bonus 10% point that you can spend in the future, right? And so then it's like, okay, well, you know, I missed three times, but now I'm going to use my 30% uh, bonus to get me from 70% all the way up to 100%. And I know I'm going to hit this time, something like that, where you can, you're accumulating some sort of currency that allows you to offset the randomness so that yeah, most of the time it's pretty random, but sometimes when it really counts, you can use the your ability to control the, the randomness in your favor. I think also designers get too enamored of their randomness. Like, they forget what the randomness is for. <clears throat> the thing that always rubs me the wrong way is in XCOM. <laughs> I've got a shotgun, and I'm shooting at somebody who's literally right in front of me, and there's a <laughs> chance for my professional... Heart, battle hardened soldier to miss right and miss entirely not like miss a critical shot not like you know barely you know barely hit him but just like you either are completely all all pellets land on target or they're just gone somewhere else in another dimension right, <laughs> right. like how did i miss this seven foot alien standing right in front of me right. um like, how is that even po Like, it's even hard to picture how that could have happened. <laughs> right. Even I, an untrained fireman, fire shooting guy, firearm man, would not be able to completely miss this guy. Right. So doing... Well, for one thing, you could also do the, oh, you've got a 90% chance per pellet to hit. That would help there. But just also sometimes it's okay for you to put the dice down and say, yeah, this is going to happen. You don't yeah, need to... Yeah, at a certain range, to... it's 100% chance that you're going to hit him with a shotgun. Right. You don't need to roll for every... The, the tabletop gaming equivalent of people get so enamored of rolling dice that they're making you roll for, you know, common things. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, it doesn't make you roll to, like make your your dropship take off from your base and then make it fly over to the landing zone and then make it land successfully right right all right you gotta take a piss all right roll 20 sides see if you accidentally piss all over your own feet <laughs> it's like <laughs> like there, there's some things that are okay there's you know i'll take a 10 <laughs> just some right. things should just happen yeah yeah um, you don't need to roll for every possible thing. And I, I think players at some tabletop games like that because it creates just lots of hilarious chaos. Haha, uh -huh, you, you tried to go up to the bar and you somehow spectacularly failed and ended up with something crazy happening. And that's funny right. when you're joking around the table with your friends. But when you're playing a video game and you have the DM is a, a non-creative calculator you you don't want that uh -huh. that's no fun he he can't well, and also the, when the game's taking itself very serious things like the fate of humanity right. rests on your ability to fight off this incursion of aliens and they've landed and they're big and scary and like what are you gonna do and then it's like ha ha you know slide whistle whoop, you missed the guy with your shotgun <laughs> womp womp i mean yeah like a human dm could like make that funny like all right you blow a hole right through his head oh wait and then you realize that's that's a hat he's wearing and he's like completely unharmed <laughs> like right. that's a funny moment and a human can do that and the machine can't it just shows your professional soldier missing a point blank shot with a shotgun and that's just frustrating and nonsensical and unjustified to the player and they get mad at the game mm. and they stop having fun well paul i think we've done a show I didn't look at the clock, yeah. but I, I, I think we did a show. We must have. Here we are at the end of a show. All right. Thanks to everybody who sent in questions. I'm sorry we couldn't cover more. We, we barely put a dent in this mail. Oh, we, 
We got nowhere. <laughs> we didn't even cover a third of them. Uh, we tried. There was just so much to talk about. In fact, I cut a few topics from today's show because there's just so much going on right now. Thank you to everybody sending questions. We're really going to try and get to them all, I promise. If you've got a question for the show and you are an incredible optimist, our email is diecast at shamusyoung.com. Say goodnight, Paul. Good night and happy new year. Happy ghost telephone. Don't get too far into the Elden Ring. Don't trip on the Elden Ring. 